Welcome to day 316 of Shaped by the Word. Paul Kemp here with Matt Kresge, Katie Kresge, and Cindy Kemp. So we have a little bit wider podcast uh, group today. <laughs> David Keefe is on vacation. Everybody knows it takes at least two people to replace Amen. Uh, David <laughs> Keefe. So, true. so um, <laughs> it should be a fun week. We're continuing our journey through the Gospel of John. Someone, have, uh, someone has referred to the Gospels as passion narratives with extended uh, introductions. And that is certainly the case in John. He moves very quickly into the conflict between Jesus and the teachers of the law and the Pharisees. The accusations are at a much higher pitch in uh, John than they are in uh, the other Gospels. And of course, he leads us into the depth of the struggle that he has. And Jesus is also far more clear about his identity in the Gospel of John than he is in Matthew or Mark Mm -hmm. or, or Luke. So we find Jesus at one of the Jewish festivals, which is also a feature of John. Uh, John more often places Jesus in Jerusalem and Jesus at the festivals and Jesus responding to the festivals, you know, as a part of the Jewish heritage and a part of his identity. So his brothers have urged him to go public. He has gone in secret, but as he is there, he's ministering, uh, you know, from the temple courts and people are seeing him and and the fever pitch is uh, uh, building up. So we pick up in the middle of uh, John chapter 7, where we left off last week, uh, verse 25. But before we uh, read, let's offer ourselves in this moment to the Lord. Uh, Cindy, do you mind lifting us up with a word of prayer? No, I don't mind. Father, we do um, come before you asking, Lord, that you would open our hearts to the things that you have for us this day. And that your word would uh, penetrate our lives in such a way that we would not walk away the same, that we would look intently at your word, that by your spirit you would change our hearts, Father, that you would convict of sin, but that you would also encourage us um, in the gospel today. Mm -hmm. So thank you for this time. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. At that point, some of the people of Jerusalem, picking up in verse 25, John chapter 7, at that point, some of the people of Jerusalem began to ask, isn't this the man they're trying to kill? Here he is speaking publicly, and they're not saying a word to him. Have the authorities really concluded that he is the Messiah? But we know where this man is from. When the Messiah comes, no one will know where he is from. Then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and yes, you know where I am from. I am not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him, but I know him, because I am from him, and he sent me. This they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him, because his hour had not yet come. Still many in the crowd believed him. They said, When the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. Then the chief priest of the Pharisees sent the temple guards to arrest him. Jesus said, I am with you for only a short time, and when I'm, and, where, and then I am going to the one who sent me. You will look for me, but you will not find me, and where I am you cannot come. The Jews said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? Will he go where our people live scattered among the Greeks and teach the Greeks? What did he mean when he said you will look for me, but you will not find me? And where I am, you cannot come. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given, since Jesus had not yet been glorified. On hearing his words, some of the people said, Surely this man is the prophet. Others said he is the Messiah. Still others ask, how can the Messiah come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say the Messiah will come from David's descendants and from Bethlehem, the town where David lived? Thus the people were divided because of him. Some wanted to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him. Finally, the temple guards went back to the chief priests and the Pharisees who asked them, why didn't you bring him in? No one ever spoke the way this man does, the guards replied. You mean he's deceived you also, the Pharisees retorted? Have any of the rulers of the Pharisees believed in him? No. But this mob who knows nothing of the law, there is a curse on them. Nicodemus, who had gone to Jesus earlier and who was one of their number, asked, Does our law condemn a man without first hearing him to find out what he has been doing? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Look into it, and you will find out that a prophet does not come out of Galilee. 
So there's an interesting uh, interchange in it between the people and and the priest and uh, the teachers of the law. And obviously anyone who has a hint of, you know, let's listen to Jesus or let's hear Jesus or, you know, let's at least examine the scripture and see if what he's saying is in keeping with the scripture is meeting with a, a lot of resistance. They've already made up their mind that whoever he is, he's such a challenge to their authority structures that they, that they want to kill him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, of course, that reminds us you know, that the gospel uh, will comfort us in so many ways, but the gospel, mm-hmm. you know, when we really understand the gospel, will also challenge us at our deep, deepest values and the things that we treasure most. And, of course, it's, it's happening to the Pharisees and to the teachers of the law. So there's a lot of interesting interchange over the person of Jesus and both mistaken notions and mm-hmm. uh, you know, true notions of who the Messiah would be mm-hmm. you know, when, he, when he does come. Mm-hmm. So what are some of the things as you guys read this passage that stand out to you? Go for it, Matt. I know you have something yeah, with, to say. with four people, yeah. we're all hesitating. <laughs> yeah. and, and jumping first. in there. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think one of the things that stands out to me, and it was so good of Katie to give Matt permission. <coughs> I know. You, you know, have to go permission. for it. There, there you Usually go. she just like jumps in and takes my whatever my thunder. But um, <laughs> yeah, it, it stands out to me, especially kind of over the next few chapters, where you you kind of watch this division spill over into mm-hmm. you know, conflict, and and they're you know they're seeking to kill Jesus, they're mm-hmm. seeking to to seize him or to beat him, and yet his hour had not yet come you know john kind of reminds us that even as you know man is planning and purposing things against you know what god has purposed god's purpose supersedes theirs you know that that god remains sovereign and he's carrying out his sovereignty in his timing and in his place and and i love even there's Mm -hmm. times where it's like jesus just you know in the next chapter it's like he just sneaks away. You know, it's like, how did he get away? How did no one know where he went? Uh, they tried to lay hands on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, it's, it's and that's a very interesting, you know, emphasis that is unique to the Gospel of John. Uh, you know, already his brothers, you know, said, "Why don't you, you know, go to Jerusalem and do many of the things that you're yeah. doing publicly?" Anybody who wants to be a public figure needs to go to Jerusalem, and they need to be, you know, visibly seen. And, and Jesus, you know, said to them, you can choose to go at any time and you can choose to do whatever you want to, uh, but uh, I cannot because my hour has not yet come. And, and, of course, he's talking about the fact that I'm I'm operating on God's timetable and you're operating on your own timetable. I'm operating according to God's wisdom and, of course, you're, mm-hmm. you're operating according, you know, to human wisdom. Mm-hmm. And there's a beautiful picture, you know, of God's sovereignty there that, uh, they can't lay a hand on him because uh, they only do so when God is is ready for oh, that yeah. to happen in His mm-hmm. sovereign will, in His sovereign way. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so God's hand is on him, uh, you know. To uh, well, God's hand on him, you know, completely. But God is the one who is in control, not the Pharisees, not the teachers of the law, not the people. And so there's a nice picture of yeah. sovereignty in the emphasis that John gives us. And the the striking, you know fact that they don't know him that mm-hmm. they don't know god and he says if, if you knew god you would know that he has sent me Yeah, you know, because but because you do not know him you don't know that he sent me and so not only do they not know the purposes of god he goes back and says you don't know the very god that you're seeking to defend mm-hmm. Yikes. And, and jesus does a nice little turn there i said we know where you're from you can't be this messiah and and jesus is speaking you know not of, of being from galilee or being you know, from Joseph and Mary, but have been sent from the Father. Mm-hmm. Yes, you do know where I'm from, yeah. and the one who has sent me you know, is, is, is the Father. Mm-hmm. So it's a nice change, you know, nice turn of phrase that Jesus is doing there as well. Yeah. So mm-hmm. apparently they don't know that he was born in Bethlehem because they talk about how, mm-hmm. you know, the prophecies say that he'd come from Bethlehem. They just think they think he's from Galilee, but they don't realize that. Is that... No, that, that uh, yeah, that's... Uh, he has referred to, you know, uh, universally through you know through the gospels is Jesus, you know yeah. from Nazareth. Nazareth. So it is you know assumption that they're making, and and of course the birth you know in Bethlehem, uh, we know about it as a fulfillment of scripture. But it was probably one of those events that hardly you know took mm-hmm. notice, uh, you know outside of you know just that immediate you know immediate group around Bethlehem. And of course, hmm. quickly they swept away into Egypt mm-hmm. and then came back you know to. Nazareth, so avoiding you know, you know, a combination of that. So it probably was not well known mm-hmm. that Jesus had been uh, born in Bethlehem, of the city of David. 
I think the paragraph that stands out to me the most in this passage is starting at verse 37. On the last and greatest day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. And by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Um, and I had in my margin um, Ezekiel 47, like exclamation point, because I, I, I do get very excited about just this theme of the river and the living water. Mm -hmm. And so if you go back to Ezekiel 47, which I would really encourage anyone listening to this to do, um, there's just such a beautiful description of this river that Ezekiel is um, experiencing, envisioning. Um, and so just read that whole passage in 47, but I'll just start um, with verse 12. It says, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor will their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. I mean, such um, such a picture of healing, of mm -hmm. fruitfulness. I mean, it, it brings us back to Psalm 1. Mm -hmm. And um, this is the work of the Spirit. And, um, man, it just makes me so excited that, that this is the same Spirit that is dwelling within me and the mm -hmm. same Spirit that is at work in our world today. And, and you now there's you know, some incredibly rich you know, images here. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you see the same image. Uh, you know, in Revelation, you know, uh, 20, uh, 21 and 22, where the river's flowing from the throne of God and the yeah. tree of life is there and it yields fruit in every season and its yeah. leaves are for the healings of the nations. But even when you have the Apostle Paul, you know, going into a synagogue where there was not a synagogue, he would go to a river. Yeah. And, and of course, hmm. uh, there you would have a Jewish place of prayer. And the river was that symbol of, you know, God's fruitfulness and the gift of life. And this is, you know, this is a Feast of Tabernacles, which would remind them of, you know, of the you know, sojourn in the mm -hmm. wilderness, but is also, you know, combined with the harvest. And as one of the great acts of the festival, you know, the high priest would take a huge pitcher of water and pour it over the altar as a foreshadowing of God's, you know, coming fruitfulness. And when you have in this particular text, on the last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood up that exactly coincides with that last and greatest day of the feast and the fact that he sang it in a loud voice means he's probably saying it at that precise moment when the water is being oh poured out you know on the altar and he's saying if anyone is thirsty let him you know come to me mm -hmm. and so there is a you know just kind of a nice you know nice move but water would have been a big part of that you know part of that mm -hmm. festival Right. Big part of the Old Testament anticipation of the fruitfulness, you know, uh, uh, of God, mm -hmm. and uh, just as you read, you know, in Ezekiel. Beautiful. And it's a reminder that whole passage is the same exchange that he had with the woman at the well. Mm -hmm. You Absolutely. know, so thirst was always, you know, in front of people. I guess when you're a desert people, you're always thinking water anyway. But when she said, "Well, I want this living water because I would like to not have to come to this well all yeah. the time," and to talk about, "No, that I give you superior water, water that springs yeah. from within." So, mm -hmm. and, yeah, and, and goes back to you know Jeremiah's prophecy, you know, chapter two, or, or Jeremiah's you know condemnation of Israel. Said, "My people have committed two sins; uh, they have forsaken me, mm -hmm. the spring of living water, and they have dug their own cisterns, broken cisterns." Mm -hmm that will never hold water and so the things that we you know turn to to satisfy us deeply and that's what the image is about always leave us more hungry than we were you know before we turn to them but god promises deep lasting you know satisfaction mm -hmm. and of course you have to like the you know the image of the spirit had not been given because right. jesus had not been glorified and mm -hmm. this is a a gift to us you know from our glorified risen king part of the gifts that he bequeaths us with and the richest gift and we should never forget this mm -hmm. is not simply the holy spirit and, and and of course it's a that's a big gift to begin with mm -hmm. but the holy spirit is the presence of god intimately with mm -hmm. us and jesus said himself i will send you another helper and i myself will come to you so it's the presence of you know the trinity in us through his you know spirit mm -hmm. uh, so you're going to hear this a lot in john he's going to talk about language i am the father father is in me and you are in me 
uh, and of the union that we have with God through the Holy Spirit at the gift of you know Christ, mm -hmm. our exalted King. Mm. There's way too much to talk about and a lot of time. Yeah. There is. I was going to give you one more shot, Matt. <laughs> I, just, I mean, I'll, I'll comment on the, I love the, the invitation, let anyone who's thirsty come to me and drink. I mm -hmm. mean, the, the condition is we come to Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not because we've made ourselves thirsty. It's it's not because, you know, we don't right. have the things in order to satisfy. Our, it's He's saying if you're thirsty, if anybody, it doesn't matter why you're thirsty. The invitation is to come to me because he is the one who satisfies and all those other mm -hmm. things, are maybe the reasons we are thirsty, begin to fade away when we, yeah. we come to him. No, so I love the invitation, come to, come to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Why don't you close us in prayer, yeah. Matt? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this text. We thank you for the invitation to, to come to Jesus, to be satisfied in him. And um, as we reflect more on, on your word today and the invitation, um, Father, would you draw us to Jesus? Would you, by your spirit, um, help us to come to be satisfied in you? Um, and to enjoy you. We thank you for this time and your word. Would you use it to continue to transform us, to glorify you, um, and to enjoy you. Father, we love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.